Okay, so let me start by thanking the organizers for this wonderful meeting. I had to arrive late, but already have some great discussions. So um, I'm going to discuss a recent paper and a uh, lot of ongoing work that um, is generating with these wonderful collaborators, Rafael Blauber, Merida Murphy, and Leonardo Santori, along with uh, others involved in the uh, next steps. So uh, this is a brief outline. Um, we heard a beautiful review of the whole subject by Daniel earlier, so I'll be able to hopefully um, explain this clearly without the background. Um, in this uh, talk in particular, I'm going to be discussing the sensitivity that non-Gaussian correlators have at all then um, to heavy field production. And this is partly motivated by the physics and couplings that axioms have in string theory, but it's a more general I'll explain that. I'll explain the shapes and the amplitude of these endpoint functions, um, which have some interesting features, one of which is that they are, this is very easy to have happen, they are orthogonal to previously analyzed shapes of non-gassy entity. And somewhat more interesting or novel is that they can have a growth of signal noise with the, the number of points n, um, which will lead us to consider the whole probability distribution to play more of a role than it usually does. Um, so we'll discuss that and what we're uh, aiming for with the analysis toward the end. Okay, so as we did just hear here in the uh, first talk, cosmological data is wonderfully precise and it gives us truly interesting constraints on what was going on 14 billion years ago in terms of the contents and interactions of the theory. Um, and some possibilities for this have been constrained as much as possible in the CMB, but most haven't because it's an infinite dimensional space. Um, it's a reasonable subject to talk about at strings because string theory has kind of had an unreasonable impact on the subject. Um, it's generated interesting dynamical mechanisms which have opened our eyes to the range of inflationary dynamics and signatures which then get incorporated in the effective field theory treatment that Daniel reviewed so beautifully, um, and even data analysis. So today's talk will, in a nutshell, be a new example in this tradition uh, with some novel features and have some new tests. So let me, uh, he, he, uh, again, referring to Daniel's talk, he did a beautiful job from the bottom up. Let me very briefly review how things went from the, from the top down. So in single field slow roll inflation, non gassy entity you know, can be studied and wanted the proper translation in 2002. Uh, but it's small because the dimension is bad and the kinetic term is simple. Uh, it was already known, of course, that if you don't have just a single field, but have additional fields, those transverse directions are not so constrained. They can be quite nonlinear. Um, but even for a single field, and this is the first thing that string theory has projected into the subject, um, it happens that self-interactions can, for very simple reasons really, slow the field down and produce inflation, which just requires a slow varying pool, um, in a way that's very different from single field slow roll inflation. And not surprisingly, with those self-interactions uh, slowing the field as part of the background solution, the perturbations are that much more non -gassing. Okay. And there's other, other uh, contributions to non gaussian entity, um, including the two I've listed here. Uh, the second one is one that, that uh, we heard a lot about this morning. The first one is something I also need to compare to what we're doing today, uh, which is uh, resonant non gaussian entity um, and is what you get from a simple model motivated again by axion physics with a sinusoidal correction to the potential. Um, so in that context, the thing I want to focus on is the way that the signal to the noise ratio of the non entity in that type of uh, dynamics is in any weakly coupled version, which we have control over, less than one is bounded by one. Um, well, as I mentioned already, that will contrast with what we find in the dynamics we talked about today. Um, which also can be compared and contrasted to this quasi single field idea where you can see the massive particles uh, <coughs> produced just by virtue of the Hubble expansion. Um, and that leads to an amplitude with the effects, which are exponentially suppressed in M over H. Um, whereas we'll consider more generic order one coupling of the heavy fields to begin with on, um, which gives us a sensitivity to a two orders of magnitude. 
magnitude higher scale in energies. So in a nutshell, the dynamics I'm referring to is following a couple of liquid ponds with some heavy fields. And again, as Henry said, in string theory, things coupled to other things quite generically. Um, and this can happen in a way that doesn't ruin the overall trend of inflation, either through a regular periodic effect, say, through symmetry arguments, or in a more random way. Um, once you have that dependence of some massive field, mass M chi, on the background of the initial problem, that's a time dependent action for it, and it produces a level with a characteristic scale being the scale of, of the time dependence in this context of a background solution that's basically so whole inflation that's this phi box. So it's a PU um, squared times double squared. Um, so the, when, when these particles are produced, this coupling to the background solution also entails a coupling to the perturbations of the scalar field phi, and hence automatically to some radiation of these coupled phi perturbations, which we calculate. Um, and the amplitude of this is exponential written here. In terms of the sensitivity of observations to it, the basic estimate you would do is to expect the sensitivity that's given by one root one over the square root of n, where n is the number of pixels in and out. Um, and we'll see that a de very detailed analysis bears that out, uh, leading to a novel shape with the input functions and different ranges of parameters, but in some of them, uh, as I keep emphasizing the signal to noise control of n, which is an interesting new thing. So in terms of the scales, we already heard about this uh, with jacking it up to this state, uh, relative to the Hubble scale and then bigger out factor of five or six out above that. Um, and again, uh, the picture is the infoton can couple to other degrees of freedom. It's true there we have many candidates for this KK modes that feel the motion of the background of the infoton field and another things, um, modeling and noise, et cetera. Um, and again, they can do this in a regular way, which is the case we'll study in detail, but they can also do it in a more random way, and more general way, and we'll eventually get to uh, methods for constraining all, all, all of the above. Um, so if you think about this from the bottom up, the point is just that that effective field theory of inflationary perturbations um, has in it arbitrary functions of time, even in the truly single field level. Um, and because the data can be sensitive to even these exponentially suppressed effects, we can't take data green out of fields that are even heavier than this line up scale. Um, and hence, the single field version of the model is, is you know, less relevant than you might even think, um, given the scales. So you might wonder, for how it is that this exponential effect can be important, given that these fields do also generate through rated corrections or just integrating them out classically, contributions that are power loss suppressed in their mass. Um, and the reason for that is just that the details matter. In, in essence, our results have this exponential times a large P factor. Um, so the non-gaussian entity from these power law effects of the, of the uh, massive field mass M um, are on the top line here. They are the power law type of effects. And if you just trace that through and estimate the non-gas entity in a reasonable, accrued way, of taking the ratio of the, of the three to two point part of the Lagrangian, you find that it's, it's a tiny effect. Um, but it does allude to this effect that is proportional to this exponentially small thing I keep emphasizing uh, because of power law three Explain um, that in this that depend on this ratio, you know, six orders of magnitude. Okay, so this is a somewhat general thing, but two cases are rather directly motivated by axiom monotony. The structure there of the branches and the potential is mirrored in a branch structure of the excitations of the theory as well. So higher co-dimension objects in the theory also have the same kind of branch structure. And that means that each of the underlying periods, you know, some new sector comes down, becomes as light as it's become, and then gets heavier again. That'll be the case that we call case A. 
Another case is simply that the underlying periodicity of axions in the string theory means that the uh, other fields that are around feel that periodicity, and their masses, like moduli in the string application and so on, can't help but get some level of modulation as a result. And so just because of that, we, we expect contributions to the mass uh, square, say, the number of the soil, so we'll analyze that case, which we call case B. And in fact, the first thing generates a second by a Weinberg calculation um, as well. So again, uh, this could be studied more generally, including in the opposite regime, where it's a, a random distribution of mass, mass uh, dependences. So maybe corrections are always important. Um, here we're not concerned with a very particular model, but we did want to make sure that there wasn't any radiative correction that is intrinsic to the supersymmetry breaking of the independent background, which would constrain the level of uh, these coupling and hence the level of the non-Gaussianity. So obviously the larger the couplings are, the larger the nonlinear effects can be. Um, so it's an important point. Um, but in fact, there's no really uh, useful constraint from that. Um, if you imagine some level of microscopic supersymmetry qualitatively, of course, in loops, both on the fermions cancel and non idiomatic effects, they don't. They add up. Um, so that's what this means. Why there's no reason for, for a, a direct parametric cancellation of this. Um, we also pose the usual slew of consistency conditions <coughs> scenario. Um, Partly for simplicity here, we insist that it's a slow, all the underlying inflationary model is slow roll. Uh, so we, these high fields, these heavy fields that are produced, don't factor out in the evolution in a significant way. Of course, there are interesting scenarios where that isn't true, but let's just be clear about this one. Okay, so in slightly more detail, um, uh, what are you doing? Um, the uh, Time of mass means uh, source for these delta flies, as I explained. Um, the background homogeneous motion is a time dependent homogeneous uh, action for these heavy fields, which, which excites them. Uh, in, the in the leading approximation, that generates a squeeze state uh, in which then the delta phi fields are produced. Um, so, there are many contributions, I'll give like the general formula shortly, but the one that leads in an interesting regime of parameters is, is a very physical one, which is basically a three-point function of two of these high fields and, uh, and a delta phi. So you produce a source um, from that interaction uh, whose correlation functions, so you produce a, a source of uh, delta phi's, uh, which have correlation functions that are essentially plus one. They have a they have endpoint functions which are all proportional to the density of produced high particles here. Um, and the formula for that is is the one which shows the power law enhancement that I mentioned earlier. So there's a slide out to the three halves, the exponential, and then they just then you have the exponential. Okay, so you produce the source and uh, to compute the correlators of the delta phi perturbations just involves, um, let me go get there, uh, integrating that source against the specific Green's function for those perturbations. Um, but before getting there, let me, for the record, write down a fully general calculation, um, which is an in in correlator of these delta phi and the full model, including the chi field, which cannot be integrated out. Um, and the time dependent evolution will generate the appropriate speed state, which we can change variables and just introduce into the in end calculation. There's a lot of diagrams that can contribute. The ones that I was just describing in words are these ones with three point vertices. The blue lines here are the, describe a pair of produced high particles with delta phi lines coming off. And those can come off in higher point vertices as well. Uh, which we'll talk about more when we get to the large end behavior. Um, okay. 
the, the, the ones I circled here can be leading in uh, these low flight functions, and they factorize in a way that's also useful for practical purposes. Um, so the methods of computing this particle correction are very, very standard, so let me not dwell on it. Um, but let me just say, for these two mass functions that I mentioned, uh, we have a luxury of isolating the non-adiabatic time scale to um, isolate the points, and we can just add up. So then the sinusoidal model is the minimum of the mass at each period, and the other one is, is the obvious uh, minimum of these masses. Um, but again, you can, you can calculate it in full generality. Um, and then integrate against the Green's functions to get the delta phi perturbation. So in terms of uh, basic, basic integral of the Green's function against the time dependent mass, which can have saddle points, resonant saddle points that enhance the effect, these are the answers for the endpoint function. They're all proportional to one power of the density of the produced fields. That's the underlying Poisson statistics of the source. And then uh, these particular diagrams I circled are given by a single sum of a factor of identical product, a product of identical factors uh, as written here. Um, and you can just calculate this in terms of the parameters uh, that enter into the scenario. This integral of the Green's function against the time varying mass. Let me focus on this case B with the oscillating mass, has resonances, and it's those resonances that, in, that, that end up enhancing the amplitude of the non Gaussian correlators um, by a factor of the square root of the frequency of events. So, uh, the level of the signal of noise in the three-point function to the power spectrum, and that any such ratio of n plus one to n, there's a simple ratio given by some combination of couplings that I call C D times this over H. And um, for aficionados, again, this is although the some of the underlying motivation is similar to that resonance case I described earlier, uh, this is quite different in the the and that there it was understood um, that the signal noise in, in the non gas unit is, is at most um, generically smaller than that in the power spectrum, but here um, it can go the other way. Okay, so um, that introduces some interesting further directions. Um, but before I get there, even if we work in a regime where that ratio is smaller than one, you can ask about the shape of the correlator. The shape of the three point function. Again, as Anna briefly mentioned, there are some limited dimensional spaces of things, and in this context, this shape that we calculate turns out to be very, uh, have very low overlap with all the previous ones, including the resonance shape and, of course, the scale invariant shape uh, discussed earlier. So it's um, being searched for separately as, as it needs to be. We want to know the answer. Um, but then again, this regime where it grows with n is even more interesting, at least more novel, and in that case, of course, the three-point function is not the same shape that can go up and n or talk about the whole distribution. Okay, so um, because this is also turned out to be interesting, let me mention some of the other diagrams that their parameters here, they sometimes matter, they sometimes don't. Um, and of course, we could consider the contributions, we could consider the contributions where uh, it's not just these uh, sources coupled linearly to delta phi, but other higher correction. And um, the, you know, the, we can assess how much they matter, and they can be small, but it turns out that as we increase the number of points in our endpoint function, they can enhance by combinatorial factors. Uh, for any fixed value of the couplings, so that um, motivates considering them as well. Okay, so um, in, in ongoing work, we are looking at the whole distribution. So in general terms, that's a functional integral, uh, the square of the wave function that is k 
calculated in the standard way, just the quantum local field theory. Um, again, including the chi fields, these heavy fields, not, not prematurely integrating them out. Um, and that generates the appropriate squeeze states and all the diagrams that, that contribute. Um, so, one thing we can do with this that should be, so this business of the overlap of shapes is, it's, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, it's, you know, means that we don't have a systematic way of constraining non gaussian entity, period. Um, uh, there are many ways it can be in there. We can only constrain what we look for. We don't want to look for <laughs> arbitrary things because then we use up the data due to the proposal effect. Um, but one thing that we could do that would be not optimal for any particular model, but could give interesting constraints on anything like this with a, with a growth in the demand, which means that there's some tail um, that could compete with the Gaussian, uh, is to look at just kind of a histogram. So take out of all the contributions um, to the CMD map that make a given temperature fluctuation. Um, so, you know, from the field theory we start with, we can calculate what it imprints onto that histogram by just, just introducing a delta function to enforce that, to count all the contributions that add up to the delta phi hat temperature fluctuation. Um, and, and again, the nice thing is that these things just add. They don't oscillate away or fail to overlap. So it should give us a way to do some kind of constraint of this point generally. Uh, of course, we can work it out in detail and simplifies a lot in special cases, like cases where the shape factorizes, um, which happened for the first contribution I described. Um, and then you get a nice formula for the non Gaussian distribution that results. Um, and it will be interesting to see what we can constrain using that. So, when it comes to the data, you can do these more crude but basic tests. So this, this picture is not coming out, maybe, but it's a Gaussian curve that is the histogram for the data. Um, <laughs> a little non-Gaussian, there's a gold spot and so on, but it's, it's you know, the thing I described, so you can't do this. Um, and that's a very basic thing. It doesn't refer to any particular scenario or any particular dynamics. Of course, once you have such a thing, you want to do the optimal search, which which involves the details of those correlators. Uh, and um, we expect the sensitivity determined by the level of, by the number of pixels in the data, which is 10 to the 6 or so. So, and look, for three point functions, it's well known what the optimal estimator is. It's the appropriate dot product of the data in the theory. Um, but even there, it's only tractable if, in fact, there's a good approximation to the shape which, which has this factor. Just because of the number of independent sums over uh, L's that we need to do. Um, and certainly for larger n, it just would go out of the realm of possibility entirely to do it the traditional optimal way for all contributions to the shape. Um, the factorized part of it, which is interesting, we can do and we will do with large n, but the um, other contributions to the shape, which can be enhanced by interesting combinatorial factors. Uh, don't fall into this category. So this is a fun question. This is not something we, this is a question, not an answer, but could it be that these methods, um, that we could speed up the analysis by using these fancy machine learning techniques that are um, developing rapidly these days where you know, neural networks can fast rep recognize a cat versus a dog, uh, <laughs> which is probably not a factorizable shape. Um, and uh, could, could that kind of, uh, process to be trained to reliably recognize the shape through the supervised learning, the shape of, of uh, like that's the ending that we, that we know we don't want to look for, but that can't be done in a reasonable time and using the usual methods. Um, so that's a fun question for the future. Here are some pictures of the overlaps and the, um, kind of your band of structure of the shape and, and the overlap with uh, equilaterals. On this, the overlap of one of these scale variant shapes that Daniel mentioned is uh, on the bottom here, and you see it as the frequency gets appreciable, the overlap is negligible. 
Okay, so um, so large n theory, the large uh, n being the n, n, the n point function, is interesting. Um, so the signal to noise grows for a large range of n because the noise is given by the variance of the n point function itself, and since that's growing, um, that's a, where it's sufficiently low in this is well approximated by the disconnected piece, which is Gaussian, but eventually it catches up um, and saturates at the square root of n pixel. So um, the structure of it is, is basically this. There's some pre-factor, which is proportional to our small exponential, times this ratio x, which can be bigger than 1. Um, and you know, that x to the n has to build up. So it's um, when x is bigger than 1. So you know, even with a small equation of epsilon, there's this growing x to the n, which um, means we should analyze it better using a suboptimal higher end estimated than that three-point function. So the combinatorics is interesting. These tree diagrams are general, uh, given by partitions of n, um, because they just correspond to taking the n uh, points and connecting them to the chi fields via vertices with arbitrary numbers of delta phi's. So we just have to add up to the number n of points, and one can easily work out the common factors that go into that, um, which um, turns out to, at large n, enhance not um, to enhance certain components of the shape that are not the fully factorized one that I started with. So um, at the level of the three-point function, you see the structure, which generalizes to higher n, where the first line here is a factorized shape, it's, it's a product of three functions, each depending on one of the k's of the, of the triangle. And the, and the last line is basically this resonant shape, which is uh, omega log of the total k. But in between, you have things that are factorized um, products of logs of some sums of some subsets of k's. And those, um, therefore, are not factorized at large n. You know, the normal methods are, are prohibitively Time consuming, so this is where we want to see about that. Uh, see if there are other ways to do it. There is a, there at least still this factorized component of the shape, whether it dominates or not. And uh, even with a slightly suboptimal estimator, we can do better with that at large and then at the three point function level. And as long as for these individual factors, we have a good approximation to the shape, then we can constrain the parameter. Um, in a way that's very insensitive to the overall <coughs> size epsilon, so it's dependent on the small density, uh, which comes in to the 1 over n power. Um, so that's the plan to start with. Um, since I emphasized how, to me, it's quite interesting how, again, this data that's telling us about things that was going on 14 million years ago is so sensitive to details, right? You can, again, easily have these non-overlapping shapes generated by different kinds of dynamics, and that's really a big opportunity. Even if things are null results, you learn, if there's a well-defined thing that's being tested, you learn a lot from that. Uh, and so anyway, it raises you know, many questions, such as uh, what about the case of string production? So here we did a, a very detailed quantum field theory analysis because we wanted to have a reliable shape for test, and you know, particles are interesting. Um, now some particles appear in the string theory of the field theory space. But by the same token, you can have you know, time and attentions in the same way. So you can have some graph grade fields in the pond whose attention changes with time in a similar way. And um, this is a really interesting and subtle theoretical problem to calculate that. We have a WKB estimate for, say, a circular uh, developed uh, in some of these collaborators have listed up there, uh, which has an interesting feature that it favors, um, there's a part of it that favors larger string if the minimal tension is too small. Um, and in, in any case, the point is it behaves rather differently from the particle production process. So um, the result, if one wanted to constrain or test for this going on in the inflationary period, it would be another calculation which would need to 
be precise enough in, in detail to uh, give a shape that can be tested in a meaningful way, or maybe this can fall under the, the more general um, but less uh, um, the more the more general model from the opinion that some all of these shapes I mentioned earlier. Uh, but anyway, for strings meaning, I definitely wanted to mention this. We're also looking at whether the statistics of these produced particles can imprint in a measurable way on the uh, on the uh, observables. Okay, so here is a summary. Um, we got settled this. This not anything about dynamics. Um, Again, just reasonable or one coupling scales that are expected can lead to a new form of algaesity, both in the shape and the growth of the end of the endpoint function. Um, it's sensitive to details, uh, sensitive to high mass scale, also the details of the mass function. Um, there's more one could play with in that vein. Um, this is partly motivated, as it's part of a complete treatment of the phenomenology of axonomy, which we're going to be tested also by R in the next round. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens when the data is under analysis still, with some of the possibilities needing more work to understand how to do the um, as, as, as close to an optimal analysis as we can. Um, and again, this, this, this model of effective field theory really has to be supplemented by these fields, even though they're extraordinarily heavy. Um, so there's a question of whether we could, you should get the impression that the study of non-Gaussianity is, is a neat package that's been constrained and then doing large scale structure. It's not that easy. Um, even at the truly single field level, uh, you know, we have to not done. Um, and as we've seen here, this truly single field level is um, not reliable if there even are particles or strings that are even up at this slide up scale. So we'll let me stop there. Okay, thank you very much. So it seems to me that the luxury structure community has similar issues, similar challenges of constraining PES as the galaxy distribution function and the use of techniques of uh, or measuring the skewness and composites of the PDF directly. Is there anything useful to be extracted from it? Yeah, yeah, except the, the when I mentioned plus on statistics, it's in time. These different events are uncorrelated in time, but in space they're not. <laughs> so it's not exactly the same problem, but yeah, the point source um, I just mean quite generally also for them it's less useful to express things in terms of just the bias spectrum but they have to look at the full PDF. Yeah, yeah, right. So I'm just wondering if the... Oh, if the that's answer. already... Yeah, that's a, that's a nice question. I'm not sure... Yeah, I'm not sure there if they have this issue with the factor of the separableness of the shape or not, for example. Um, but, yeah, I, that's a good question. 